Hello, my name is Sam Felton, the Director of the Public Health Collaboration, and welcome to our 2021 virtual conference. It's been a difficult year to say the least, but I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to all of our ambassadors, members, patrons, and scientific advisory board members for all of your support through these difficult times. Without you, we would never be able to continue to better inform the public about the power of lifestyle to help create a better world. Now, before I let the next presenter speak, this conference is 100% free for all forever. However, if you find the content here today valuable, uh, then please consider a £2 donation or whatever you can afford via www.phcuk.org forward slash donate or if you're in the UK, you can simply text PHC to 70660 to donate £2 directly from your phone. And of course, texts are charged at your standard network rate. We hope you enjoy the conference from wherever you are in the world and be sure to get involved in the civil conversation here on YouTube or by using the hashtag PHC vcon 2021 on facebook instagram and twitter thanks for your support and be well hi i'm gary Taubes. i'm a journalist author the latest book is the case for keto rethinking weight control and the science and practice of low carb high fat eating i'm co-founder of the nutrition science initiative just for background, this is a talk I put together originally in 2018 in June, so uh, going on three years ago. Uh, the British Medical Journal and uh, uh, Swiss Re, the huge uh, Swiss reinsurance company, hosted a conference called Food for Thought, and the idea of the conference was to bring together uh, researchers from the sort of uh, low-carb metabolic uh, disease uh, part of the world, our part of the world with uh, uh, the establishment researchers and to see what kind of compromises we could come to. And it was an interesting conference. It, it, it lasted for a day. And then the next day, the uh, Swiss Re hosted a conference uh, just of the uh, researchers, physicians, clinicians who were using uh, low carb, high fat diets in their uh, in their practices uh, and in their research. And in the course of this meeting on Saturday, when we were speaking with the conventional wisdom people, one of the interesting aspects of it is uh, one of the most precise statements of what I believe, which is that the problem with modern diets isn't the calories, it's the carbohydrates, was given by a Tufts University nutritionist, the head of the nutrition department there, Darius Mozafarian. And yet much of what I think and what Dr. Mozafarian think are very different. And I was trying to understand that night why we could be in accord on this idea that it's the carbohydrates in the diet that we have to worry about, not the calories or, or even the fat. And yet when it comes to dietary prescriptions for the general public, we would differ so dramatically. So that led me into thinking about this. In turn, I then proceeded to do the research for my new book, The Case for Keto, which included interviews with over 120 physicians around the world who have converted to this way of thinking, where they believe that the best thing they could do for their patients is to prescribe low carb, high fat, ketogenic diets, and uh, ideally get them to eat them naturally. And so those exercises together led to this talk, which is a sort of review of where we stand circa 2021, now three years later. And in doing that, I wanna talk about where we started to begin with. So the state of affairs, the first time I ever reported this as a journalist, and I am a journalist, was in 1998 when I did an article for a Science Magazine on the, the obesity epidemic, which had first been identified a few years earlier by NIH researchers. And 1998, they published a paper making it clear that obesity rates in the United States had jumped dramatically. And at that point in time, uh, there were maybe a dozen physicians worldwide prescribing low-carb, high-fat diets. Half of them had written diet books. 
Um, if they told their patients to go on this, uh, to eat this way, their patients would then go up and see another doctor who would say, wow, you lost 30 pounds. How'd you do it? And the patient would say, well, I've been following what was then called Atkins. And the doctor would say, are oh, you going to kill yourself? That's insane. You've got to stop. There were authorities, when I interviewed the authorities, and I interviewed over 600 of them for my first book, which was published in 2007, there were authorities even back then, uh, Jerry Reben at Stanford, uh, J.P. Flatt at the University of Massachusetts, who told me that if they knew this was a great way to lose weight, uh, you know, if you want to lose weight, go on Atkins, but they assumed the consequences were deadly. So in effect, you would lose a lot of weight, your cholesterol, LDL cholesterol would go up and you would die of a heart attack. And at the time, uh, a healthy diet was defined as a low fat, low salt diet. And if you wanted to lose weight, of course you had to restrict calories. That was the conventional wisdom, the dogma. So interestingly in 1998, also uh, Malcolm Gladwell, the famous you know, best-selling uh, ubiquitous uh, New Yorker journalist wrote an article for the New Yorker, one of the first he ever did called the Pima Paradox, which was asking this question, in effect, what triggered the obesity epidemic? And in, as Malcolm likes to do, he used a, a very colorful scene using the Native American tribe, the Pima uh, in uh, Arizona as his point of discussion is the Pima have about the highest rates of obesity and diabetes uh, among the highest rates in the world. And Malcolm told this story. And well, he said, we have been told that we mustn't take in more calories than we burn, that we cannot lose weight if we don't exercise consistently, that few of us are able to actually follow this advice. It's either our fault or the fault of the advice. And then he said, medical orthodoxy naturally tends towards the former position. They want to blame us for not being able to follow the advice and diet books tend towards the latter. And given how often the medical orthodoxy has been wrong in the past, that position is not on its face irrational and it's worth finding out whether it's true. And Malcolm went through the exercise of doing that and decided it was in effect that we get fat because we eat too much and we don't exercise enough. And in the course of doing this, he, he discussed Atkins and uh, Barry Sears book, The Zone. And he talked about how diet books have a very specific structure and he called it a conversion narrative. And he said, Atkins is a conversion narrative at its finest. Dr. Atkins, a hum humble corporate physician is fat. He begins searching for answers. He tests his unorthodox views on himself as if by magic, he loses weight. He tests his unorthodox views on patients as if by magic, they lose weight. Incredibly, he has come up with a diet that produces steady weight loss while setting no limit on the amount of food you can eat. In 1972, inspired by his vision, he puts pen to paper. And so the way Malcolm Gladwell uses this story is it's kind of a con, right? This is a, a, a story that any physician will tell. The revelation in interviewing the 120 physicians I interviewed for the case for keto is that without a conversion narrative, nobody buys into this. So if you're lean and healthy and fit and you're eating a conventionally healthy diet, you have nothing to learn by switching your diet. You have no reason to switch your diet. If you're overweight or obese, if you're a humble corporate physician who's getting fatter and you've been doing what you've been told to do, then you have a pretty good idea of whether you're following your advice yourself. And now you could make the decision that maybe it doesn't work for you. And if you're a curious, uh, uh, individual, you might go looking for other ways to do it. And you might find a method that actually works. It allows you to produce steady weight loss without hunger. And if you find that, that's going to be a pretty remarkable revelation. And so what I found in interviewing 120 physicians for my book is that everyone had gone through that. Every one of these physicians, either their patients were getting fatter and they couldn't stop that from happening or their patients were suffering from diabetes and they couldn't stop that from happening. And they decided to look for a different answer. They asked the question, maybe my advice is wrong. Maybe it's not the patients who are, you know, they asked the question that Gladwell asked or they were suffering from that issue themselves. And if you can hear it, that's my dog barking in the background. He'll probably interrupt more than once, I apologize. So the conversion narrative is that it's fundamental to this idea science begins with an observation that's in conflict with expectations. 
Okay, all scientific endeavors begin like that. And in this case, the expectation is that if I eat in moderation and I watch my calories and I eat real foods and I eat healthy foods, I will stay lean. And if I'm getting fatter anyway, or my blood sugar is getting increasingly out of my control and becoming more and more diabetic, that's the observation that's in conflict with the expectation. Now you do something about it. If you find something that works, and in this case, clearly for many people, low carb, high fat ketogenic diets work and that they allow people to achieve and maintain a healthy weight, then you're going to find that a revelation. You might even become zealous about it. If you're a physician, you're gonna test it on your patients. You're gonna, your patients might say, gee, doc, how'd you lose? You look, look like you lost 30 pounds. And you're gonna say, well, I, I tried keto or Atkins or South Beach or whatever variation you might've tried. And then, then you might say to the patient, you know, I, 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 it worked. You wanna try it? Well, test your lipids, we'll go from there. Um, okay. So state of affairs, payment paradox, going in the wrong direction. Okay, let's now zoom forward to the state of affairs circa 2021. So remember in 1998, when I first wrote about this or 2002, when I did this infamous New York Times cover story, what if it's all been a big fat lie? I would guess there were a dozen, half a dozen to a dozen physicians in the country who thought that they should tell their patients to eat low carb, high fat or ketogenic diets. In order to assess how many there are today in the world, my estimate is there are a few tens of thousands. Okay, and my calibration is this simple. There is a Facebook group in Canada, Canadian Women Physician Low Carb High Fat Network that has 4,000 members. This is as of this week. Okay, now there are about 45,000 women physicians in Canada. So effectively one in 10 women physicians in Canada. If there's an equal number of men following this diet, assuming these women are still following the diet, they may not have, they may have joined the Facebook group and then fallen off the diet and forgot to, to cancel it or whatever you do with Facebook groups. But if there's an equal number of men, we have 8,000 physicians in Canada who believe this is the healthiest way for them to eat and would assume they would prescribe this to their patients. So I think a conservative guess is a few tens of thousands worldwide, and it could be a lot more. There's no way to tell. Uh, in 2019, the American Diabetes Association uh, did their uh, consensus, a study of uh, nutrition therapy for adults with diabetes or prediabetes. And this was fascinating. It was a consensus report. And what they concluded that a variety of eating patterns are acceptable for the management of diabetes. But then it said, until the evidence surrounding comparative benefits of different eating patterns and specific individuals' strengths, healthcare provides. Sorry, my typing is not what it should have been. Should focus on the key factors that are common among the patterns, which is emphasize non-starchy vegetables, minimize added sugars and refined grains, choose whole foods over highly processed foods. So they're saying until we have better studies, carbohydrate restrict. There's no mention of restricting dietary fat. There's no mention of eating in this case, a Mediterranean diet or a DASH diet. Um, they say reducing overall carbohydrate intake has demonstrated the most evidence for improving glycemia and may be applied in a variety of eating patterns. For select adults with type 2 diabetes not meeting glycemic targets or where reducing anti-glycemic medications is a priority, reducing overall carbohydrate intake with lower, very low carb eating plans is a viable option. So this was kind of a remarkable step forward. The American Diabetes Association uh, in 2019 saying for many patients, uh, even a very low carbohydrate, which would be a, a, a high fat ketogenic diet is an appropriate approach. Um, the reason this happened is interesting. There are panel members, authors of this paper who study and have done clinical trials involving very low carb uh, ketogenic diets. Laura Saslow, William Yancey, to some extent, Christopher Gardner. And the, the, the challenge in this um, uh, consensus report, they had, to go, they had to go to the literature. So they had to look at what the public studies were published and they just went from the published literature. So they could say uh, low carb, very low carb, high fat ketogenic diets had been studied more than any other dietary uh, method more than the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet or the vegan diet because they actually did a literature search. Um, what's interesting, again, just the state of affairs 2021, the same year the ADA 
published lifestyle management, standards of medical care and diabetes. Now, this is a document that's published by physicians. So they weren't, they are supposed to take into account the nutrition consensus, but they don't have to. And they don't look at the data themselves. They don't look at the papers themselves. And what they concluded, most individuals with diabetes report a moderate intake of carb. Efforts to modify habitual eating patterns are often unsuccessful in the long term. People generally go back to their usual macronutrient distribution. Thus, the recommended approach is to individualize meal plans to meet caloric goals with a macronutrient distribution that is more consistent with the individual's usual intake to increase the likelihood of long-term maintenance. So in short, what they're saying is counsel your patients to eat as they've been eating all along. That way you can have confidence that your patients will, well, should say follow your advice, not flow. Uh, I was stunned by this, but this has been the advice, basically the uh, approach that the diabetes community has taken since roughly 1935. Your patients are gonna eat what they wanna eat. So tell them to eat whatever they want and we can cover the glycemia, resulting glycemia with drugs as necessary. So the, despite the fact that the nutrition consensus is moving towards low carb, high fat diets, obviously if you want to uh, limit your blood sugar excursions, the best way to do it is limit your carbohydrate intake. The, uh, the physicians defining standard of medical care couldn't go there. Uh, in the United States, there's a U.S. News and World Report, a major uh, weekly magazine, publishes every year diet rankings. They publish school rankings, high school rankings, college rankings. Those are dubious. They publish diet rankings, which are even more dubious. So the best diet circa 2021, as they've been all along, are considered the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, the flexitarian diet, which is a kind of eat what works best for you diet. Weight Watchers and the Mayo Clinic diet. When they looked at uh, carbohydrate restricted diets, diets that uh, moved towards uh, being ketogenic. South Beach came in 20, Paleo came in 31st, Atkins came in 33rd. They were only looking at 39 diets, modified keto and keto are 35th and 37th and Dukan, which is a French version of a ketogenic diet came in last. So clearly US News and World Report hasn't adjusted their thinking at all. And when they looked at weight loss diets rather than overall diets, it was the same situation. Now they put the flexitarian diet first and Weight Watchers and a vegan diet, even though there are virtually no study existing randomized controlled trials of any of these other than maybe Weight Watchers. Uh, so how did this happen? Why do you get an entirely different one in 10 U.S. News and World Report readers and in the United States are going to be, have diabetes. And the American Diabetes Association is saying for them, the most tested diets around are low-carb, high-fat diets. And it's interesting, the way the U.S. News diet ranking goes, their methodology is they put together a panel of nationally recognized experts. <clears throat> and then they ask these experts to judge the findings, judge the diets, each diet based on a number of different criteria. They give them a number, you know, one, five to highest, one to lowest, and then they take everyone's score for each question and add them up. And when you put together a nationally recognized experts, a panel of nationally recognized experts who aren't challenged, charged with going to the literature to find which, what has been studied and what aren't, and they're just charged to give their opinions. And the people you pick, so the nationally recognized experts are the people who have become nationally recognized by virtue of believing in and promoting the conventional thinking on diet. This is sort of classic group think. And then if they choose, if they recommend people to be on this panel with them, often what you'll do is you'll pick a few leaders of the panel and then you'll have them recommend experts. And those experts are going to be people they like and respect. And the people they like and respect, as with all of us, are gonna be people who think just like they do. So you put together a panel of people you, that sort of recapitulates the belief in the conventional wisdom. And what you see in the rankings is a recapitulation. You could have gotten the same rankings 20, 30, 40 years ago, although with slightly different names for the diets. Um, it's an interesting problem because even when this panel then chooses to include somebody say from we'll say from our side of the fence who believes that a low carb high fat diet is a, is a healthy diet and perhaps the single best diet for weight control as we'll discuss that person is gonna be an outlier. 
And even if he gives a five for Keto or Atkins or South Beach, it's going to average out to whatever you're going to have 20 other uh, conventional thinkers who are going to bring the, the, um, the value right down. That would be great if the percentage of like, like the ADA meeting, you had more and more, you had say 30% uh, of the individuals on the panel were keeping up with the literature and actually reporting what the science said, but even then they're gonna be a minority and unless they meet together and discuss it, you're never gonna get a panel like this to do anything but recapitulate the conventional wisdom. US News will be saying this for another 10 or 20 years if there's nothing we can do to get them to pay attention. Okay, state of affairs, interesting aspects. A few years ago, Weight Watchers uh, ran into trouble when they uh, were on the verge of declaring bankruptcy because their business is getting um, overwhelmed by people doing keto. The CEO, Mindy Grossman, attributed the problem to the keto diet, a popular eating regimen that makes bread and other carbs taboo. She said during a call with analysts Tuesday, this is a couple of years ago, that keto is, quote, becoming a cultural mean, and she even called it a keto surge. Um, in the media and blogosphere, what's interesting is basically what they're arguing about is not whether or not we're right about the value of low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic diets. I'll explain shortly why I keep referring to it as LCHF keto. Um, they're arguing about whether other studies are as good or other methods are as good. So is the, you know, if the flexitarian diet is as good as keto for weight loss and, and uh, diabetes remission and any other health markers you want, then why not do something that's more conventional and apparently less risky? So it used to be that keto would kill you. Now the argument is that these other diets are as good as keto, whatever we want to call it. And then there are people who just aren't going to change. This is one of my favorite examples, again, from a couple of years ago in New York Magazine. Uh, Mark Bittman is a well-known former New York Times uh, thirsty uh, cookbook author, um, menu writer, and then he became a uh, columnist on nutrition. One of the interesting evolutions in the media is to choose, sort of start out writing about uh, cooking you know, menus, your favorite meals. And then if you're particularly lucid, you get to evolve to writing about nutrition as though the science of nutrition takes no more conscious thought than creating a good cooking menu. David Katz is a uh, nutritionist affiliated loosely with Yale, although that affiliation might lose. He started an organization called the True Health Initiative. And they did this article in New York Magazine, the last conversation you'll ever need to have about eating right. And they, this was the questions they asked. If there's one thing I know for sure, it's that carbs are evil. This is probably the silliest of all the silly pop culture propaganda about diet and health. All planned foods are carb sources. Yeah, but carbs are evil. Well, not all carbs, sure, but I would still avoid carbs, right? Exactly the opposite is true. You cannot have a complete or healthful diet without carbohydrate sources. Why have I been led to believe that carbs are evil? Highly processed grains and added sugars are bad, not because they're carbohydrate, but because they've been robbed of nutrients. They raise insulin levels, and they're often high in added fats, sodium, and weird ingredients. Carbs are not evil. Junk food is evil, blah, blah, blah. My friend is always talking about inducing ketosis. Is that healthy? But he's losing weight. And then they say not everything that causes weight loss or apparent metabolic improvement in the short term is a good idea. Cholera, for instance, causes weight, blood sugar, and blood lipids to come down. That doesn't mean you want it. So we still have the media. This is in part uh, Bittman and Katz, both of whom, by the way, I like personally, uh, being glib and hyperbolic for the sake of or whatever the equivalent is in magazine journalism. Um, but it's still what we're fighting. This idea that there's something so extreme about a low carb, high fat ketogenic diet that, um, that you can compare it to cholera in the terms of the healthfulness of prescribing it or following it long term. So now one of the interesting aspects, I want to talk about what I learned now from this conference and talking to these uh, physicians. Um, and uh, the best, it was put to me best by a, a, a physician in Vancouver, uh, Martin Andre, a South African, uh, who said, 
you know, what we have here in our world is we have been told for the past 50 years now, since the 1970s, that we should prescribe diets by hypothesis. And the hypothesis is if you eat a conventional healthy diet, uh, low fat, low salt, mostly plant, uh, you know, beans, legumes, meat in moderation, if at all, you'll, you'll be healthier and live longer. And that competes with clinical experience. Clinical experience is the Gladwellian conversion experience, a conversion narrative. You switch the way you eat, you lose significant weight, you seem to get healthy, everything except perhaps LDL gets better. And from the physician's perspective, if you give yourself the opportunity to have the conversion narrative and to try it on your patients, you might describe that this prescribing by hypotheses is, um, is not worth doing because you have no way to judge whether the hypothesis works. So for instance, if I go on a, a low fat diet tomorrow and I live for another 30 years or, or I die of a heart attack the day after, say, what's today, Tuesday, and I die of a heart attack on Thursday, we'll never know whether the diet killed me prematurely or whether maybe I would have died earlier. You know, there's just no way to judge. There's no information involved in these uh, hypo hypotheticals that tells us <clears throat> whether we'll live longer if we go on, uh, on, on these diets or not. So let's talk about these three hypotheses. And again, I, what got me thinking about this, we had this meeting in, with the BMJ, Food for Thought and Swiss Re, and we had conventional wisdom thinkers and we had people like us. And the gentleman stood up in the audience about halfway through and he accused the meeting of being hijacked by discussions of low carb, high fat diets and keto. And the reason he felt that is because we were challenging virtually everything that the conventional wisdom people thought. So the first hypothesis that drives how we prescribe diets is this idea of energy balance and its implications. So we get fat because we eat too much. And a fundamental implication of that is that the difference between people who maintain a healthy weight for life and people who get fatter and fatter with each passing year is that the latter eat too much and the former don't the latter balance their energy intake and, excuse me, the former, the ones who stay lean balance their intake to their expenditure and the latter don't. And in this BMJ conference, a, one of the papers that was written along with the conference was with Michael Lean, a Scottish uh, obesity researcher on uh, making progress on the global crisis of obesity and weight management. This uh, balance between calorie and intake and calorie expenditure determines body weight and body fat changes. That's the fundamental message. And if you believe that, then what you believe is that pre-obese people, actually, you know, your patients and, and us at one point in time, are equal to lean people minus the ability to remain in energy balance. So that's that's what this hypothesis says. And you can think of it as uh, pre-obese people, you know, that are equal to lean people minus willpower or lean people plus gluttony and sloth. All of these are direct implications of the hypothesis. So you take two in individuals when they're say both 18 years old, for instance, my brother and myself at age 18, um, my brother was six foot five and weighed 195 pounds and I was six foot two and weighed 195 pounds. And my brother never got above 195 and I went up to 240 at one point. And so the difference between him and I by the energy balance theory is that he was able to maintain energy balance. He had willpower and I wasn't and I couldn't. Um, this has profound implications for diabetes, for diets, for obesity. So by this logic, healthy diets, uh, the diet for obesity is a healthy diet minus the excess calories or a healthy diet plus the willpower. So healthy diets and negative energy balance is another way to put it. If you're overweight, you eat the, however we define a healthy diet, you just eat not too much. And then the question becomes, how do we define a healthy diet? And this gets into sort of the second key factor here, the second hypothesis, which is nutritional epidemiology and its implications. Um, what happens in these worlds is uh, nutritional epidemiology is, is a science by which uh, you 
identify a cohort of individuals. So for instance, in the US, the most famous is the, National, uh, the nurses health study run out of Harvard. So you identify say 110,000 nurses and then you send 30,000 of them questionnaires to ask them how much they eat. And you do this one and you establish these nurses are healthy and you ask them what they eat. They fill out these food frequency questionnaires and then you follow them for 10, 20, 30 years. And you could see what people ate and compare it to what happens to the health of these people. And what you find is that when you do this kind of nutritional epidemiology, you find that healthy people tend to, healthier people tend to eat fruits, nuts, fish, vegetables, vegetable oils, whole grains, beans, yolk, cheese, eggs, poultry, and milk, and butter are kind of neutral foods. And then the unhealthy people eat on, the people who become unhealthy with time, <clears throat> eat unprocessed red meats, refined grains, starches, sugars, processed meats, high salt foods, industrial trans fat. So what you're looking at is you're basically, you start with two groups of healthy people or one group of healthy people, you look at what they eat and then you follow them forward and you're comparing what the people who stay healthy ate to what the people who become unhealthy ate. So one way to look at it from our perspective is you follow them forward in time and you look at what the people with out obesity, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome eight, and you compare that to the people who develop obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and you come out with this list of benefits and harms. And the hypothesis that comes out of this kind of study is that foods that healthy people tend to eat are better for all of us than foods that unhealthy people tend to eat. So you identify the foods that the people who don't get metabolic syndrome, obesity, and diabetes tend to eat more than the other people. And then you assume that we can all eat those foods and we all should eat those foods. That's the sort of fundamental belief system of nutritional epidemiology. Um, so you end up with this logic where we should eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Okay, these are the foods that healthy people tend to eat and the rest of us eat less of it, not too much, as Michael Pollan said. Everything in moderation is the same thinking. We eat the way healthy people eat, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, legumes, healthy fats, meat in moderation, lean meat, we just eat less of it or we eat in moderation. Blue zones is the same thinking. You identify the people who live the longest in the world, you see what they eat, and you assume we should all eat the way they eat just less of it if we're overweight, obese, or diet, you know, uh, suffer from metabolic syndrome. Um, when we go to this kind of thinking, an ordinary vegan, whole food, vegan, plant-based diet, it's another version of this. We eat what we assume is a healthy diet based on what healthy people eat. In this case, the Seventh-day Adventists tend to eat like this. And then if you're overweight or obese, if you have metabolic syndrome or diabetes, you want to eat less of it. Um, healthy eating plate is the same thinking. Eat the way healthy people eat, eat less of it. Um, when you get issues like this, when we talk about the issues between uh, with the food we eat and climate change, the assumption is that the healthiest diet is the way we all eat, is the way healthy people tend to eat, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, plant-based diets. And if you're overweight or obese, eat less of it. And that way, when we argue that we should avoid uh, meat products, for instance, animal source foods to make the environment better, the assumption is we're all going to be healthier eating plant-based diets because in these surveys, these epidemiologic surveys, that's what the healthy people tend to eat. Um, again, the direct diabetes remission clinical trial, eat healthy foods, just less of them. The conflict, the irony here is who needs a diet and nutrition advice. And it's not the people who are eating the healthy foods, it's the rest of us. Okay, so we develop diet advice based on what healthy lean people eat. And then we tell the rest of the world to eat less of that. And those of us who are not lean and not healthy, maybe the issue is not that we should eat less, but that we have to eat differently. So the conventional wisdom is we're just like the lean people, we eat too much. And the alternative hypothesis, the keto-based hypothesis, we're not just like the lean people. We will get fat and we will get diabetic if we eat just like lean people do. We're not people who, who lack willpower. 
So the healthiest diet for this phenotype, and one way to think about it is those of us who needed a conversion experience, those of us who fattened easily, as the old-fastened diet book authors would put it, we have a different phenotype that manifests itself in this modern eating environment. Um, the diet in which our phenotype does not manifest itself is a diet that puts obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, et cetera, into remission. And on some levels, it's the diet that minimizes insulin secretion. That's the easiest way to put it. So for us, it's not about eating a conventional healthy diet, but less of it, or eating a conventional healthy diet in moderation. And for your obese and diabetic patients, it's not that. If this hypothesis is right, then it's about minimizing insulin. And the science linking insulin to fat accumulation, I've discussed this in my book, but it was worked out with my books. It was worked out between uh, 1930 and 1965. It was a, a sort of revolution in understanding fat physiology. And one of the most interesting things about the science is it, it the researchers who study it came to understand that fat tissue is the most sensitive tissue in the body to insulin. And in fact, the effect of insulin on fat metabolism and fat tissue is much greater than the effect of insulin on, on blood sugar regulation and even um, in the liver on, on glycogen formation. In uh, studies were done to look at the effect of insulin on fat accumulation. If you look at this graph, this is a graph that I think is one of the most important graphs in our whole business. I don't like showing this kind of uh, data, but it's kind of vital. If you look at this graph, you start over on the right, what you're looking at is insulin levels coming down and how fat, free fatty acid turnover changes as insulin levels drop in the human body. And as insulin comes down by free fatty acid turnover, that's the oxidation of fatty acid by the lean tissue and the mobilization of fatty acid by the fat tissue. And as you can see, as insulin comes down, if you follow that line from the right to the left, from 200 to 75 to 40, you'll see that the level of uh, free fatty acid turnover stays relatively uh, stable. And then below about 25, it, jumps up, there's a threshold. And the way Rosalind Yalow and Solomon Burson put this in 1965, they said the release of fatty acids from fat cells, Yalow and Burson won the, Yalow won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the radio, creation of the radio amino assay that allowed insulin to be measured in the bloodstream for the first time. And in their very first papers, they reported that obese patients and patients with type two diabetes had surprisingly high levels of insulin and high blood pressure. So that was the, sort of confirmation of the idea that, that obesity and type two diabetics are both uh, hyperinsulinemic and um, insulin resistant. And they said release of fatty acids from fat cells requires only the negative stimulus of insulin deficiency. But insulin is, is hypersensitive to insulin. So if there's even the slightest bit of insulin in the bloodstream, your fat tissue will hold on to the fat that it's, uh, that it's, it's accumulated to date. And then if you get low enough, and unfortunately we don't know how low that has to be for any one individual, your fat tissue will dump fat into the fat tissue. This inhibition of insulin on lipolysis um, will stop and the fat tissue will mobilize fat and your lean tissue will burn it for fuel. You will actually start losing weight. This is independent of the amount of calories you're eating. It's purely the effect of insulin on the fat tissue and the insulin's responding to the carbohydrates. Um, the way yellow, uh, well, in, when this study was done in uh, 1991 by uh, uh, Ralph DeFranzo's group at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School, and they, they were one of the few uh, laboratories in the world that could do this measurement at the time. They said insulin regulation of plasma free fatty acid turnover and oxidation is maximally manifest at low physiological plasma insulin concentrations. What it means is, like I said, it's like a switch. If you look at the physiology, if you get insulin low enough, you'll mobilize fat from fat cells and you'll oxidize that fat for fuel. You will literally start losing weight. And then the question is, how low do you have to go? And the assumption, 
clinical and anecdotal observation, those of us who keep our insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia in remission by diet and so stay healthy, do so by minimizing insulin secretion, maximizing the time we spend below that threshold. So this is what we eat. We don't eat any foods. By this thinking, we avoid foods that might stimulate insulin secretion and keep us above the threshold. Fruits other than berries, vegetable oils are out, whole grains and beans are out, they have too much carbs in them, milk is out. Um, you start to see the difference between what we eat and what the conventional nutritional epidemiologists would have us eat, even when we both recognize that the problem is carbohydrates. What we're told to eat to be healthy are foods that if this alternative hypothesis is correct, if it's all about insulin, we have to avoid, mostly avoid. So they want us to add good foods to our diet, remove bad foods, eat less, and we'll be healthier. And what we want to do is just remove the bad foods. And if we remove the bad foods, we're left with some foods that they don't particularly like, unprocessed red meats, processed meats, high sodium foods, but the clinical experiences, we get healthy. Um, when you look at how this translates to sort of the fundamental concept of uh, a weight loss diet, the, the conventional wisdom is all diets that result in weight loss do so on one basis and one basis only. They reduce total calorie intake. What we mostly believe all diets that result in weight loss do so on one basis and one basis only. They reduce total carbohydrate intake or improve the quality of the carbohydrates consumed. In 1825, the French gastronome Antoine Briat Savarin wrote what has been the most famous book ever written about food, The physio uh, Physiology of Taste. And in it, he said, the way to lose weight and the way to maintain your weight is more or less strict abstinence to the carbohydrates consumed. He used the term farinaceous foods. We would say carbohydrates and he didn't play up the role of sugar because in 1825, sugar was still expensive and hard to come by, particularly in France. Um, the same thing. Here's another way to think of it. All diets that result in weight loss do so on one basis and one basis only. They lower insulin and prolong the time spent below the threshold. Now there are various ways you could do this, but the most effective is lowering carbohydrates. So by this theory, the fewer the carbs we eat, I mean, think of carnivory, then it's uh, <clears throat> the rise of the carbohydrate, uh, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the all meat diet, or the longer the time between meals, intermittent fasting, time restricted feeding, the greater the time spent below this threshold, the leaner and healthier will be. So by this thinking, by my thinking, and anything that minimizes insulin secretion and extends the time we spend below that threshold is going to extend the time we're mobilizing fat and oxidizing fat and make it easy to relatively easy to maintain a healthy weight without hunger. So the key to success commitment, there's no way to get around it. And here's where the researchers of physicians I interviewed come through. And I'm just going to go through this quickly, but Eric Westman, who did the, the first modern studies on the Keto Atkins diet at Duke University around two, beginning around 2000. He said, if you do this, it'll work, but I can't make you do it. This is what he tells his patients. He says, the word in the street is I'm too strict, but maybe strict is the answer. Remember the idea is to minimize insulin secretion. And that means minimizing the carbohydrates you're eating. Ketosis, these physicians almost universally told me that if the patient is losing weight and feeling good, they didn't care. So very few of them even talk. That's why I, I refer to this diet as a low carb, high fat slash keto diet. None of these, very few of these physicians cared if their patients were in ketosis. They didn't want them even measuring ketones because they thought it might distract them or make them feel that they were failing even when they weren't. What they cared about was whether they were losing weight and feeling good. And many of them even didn't care about the weight loss. They, they wanted to see the improvement in um, in biomarkers that universally happens with this way of eating. Um, I asked all these physicians why their patients plateaued, what happens? And I got a lot of different answers. I mean, some people swore they were following the diets, but they didn't. Uh, that's, you know, some people were eating too little fat. Some people might've been eating too many fats. 
it's possible that even on a very low carb, high fat diet, if you really want to uh, achieve a healthy weight, you might have to restrict your calories. Um, I don't think everyone has to do that, but eating fewer fat, less fat, even with no carbs will mean less fat that's stored in the fat tissue. Some people might've been eating too little protein. This is a complicated concept. If you try to do a low fat, low protein diet, <clears throat> you try to do a uh, high fat, excuse me, a low carb, low fat diet, you might be eating too much protein. There are some people, Ted Naiman in particular, who thinks that people fail on this diet because they eat too little protein. The conclusion I came to after speaking to all these physicians is that self-experimentation is key. If you reach a plateau, you have to start pulling levers. These are the kind of levers you could pull. You could add protein to your diet and subtract fat and see what happens. You could subtract protein from your diet and add fat and see what happens. And maybe it doesn't work for weight. There are a lot of hormones that regulate weight. Insulin and glucagon to some extent are the ones that do it, that connect it to what we eat and so our ability to regulate that weight. Who complies and still fails? <clears throat> it's possible the insulin sensitive do, but I, I don't actually, uh, I don't totally believe that. Uh, older women, uh, postmenopausal women, um, some of the physicians I interviewed thought they have a much harder time and anecdotally my People I hear from believe that women past menopause have a much harder time. There's a lot, they're fighting uh, the effect of uh, female sex, the, the inhibition of female sex hormones with age on fat accumulation. You secrete less estrogen, you're going to um, accumulate more fat. Alcohol drinkers, anecdotally, people who think they can eat a low carb, high fat ketogenic diet, but have four glasses of wine a night. Some people can, some people clearly can't. If I was experimenting and I was not at a weight I liked eating, abstaining from carbohydrates, I would try abstaining from alcohol. Messages that came across from these physicians. Uh, Kim Connolly told me, you know, she's talking to people who have been trying calorie restriction and healthy diets their whole life. So one thing she says, let's try something completely different. Peter Foley said, you know, the, the message I heard at, over is you can't outrun an unhealthy diet. So not that physical activity or resistance training won't help, um, might not help with weight loss or at least getting in shape. It's not the secret. And as Peter Foley said, rather than going to the gym, think about the 84 meals a month you're eating. Brian Sabowitz told me it's not about changing behavior because we eat the wrong stuff. It's about changing physiology. So what we crave and want to eat is different. And there's fairly compelling evidence that if you, when your insulin levels are elevated and you're insulin resistant, that insulin is telling your lean tissue to, to burn carbohydrates for fuel. So, and it's inhibiting the use of fat or protein for fuel. So and effectively carbs are your fuel. So if you're insulin resistant, then you almost assuredly are, if you're overweight, obese, if you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, then you're gonna crave carbohydrates because carbohydrates are what your cells can burn. When you lower insulin levels and you get below that level where the cells are now seeing insulin deficiency, now you start burning fat for food and you should start craving fatty foods instead of Carbs. That still doesn't mean, though, that if you cheat and fall off the diet and have an ice cream cone, you won't crave sweets and another ice cream cone the next day. Even if they fall off the wagon, at least they know there's a wagon to get back on. It's Catherine Kosh. When I first started doing this research 20 years ago, all the time people said, yeah, I tried Atkins. I lost 60 pounds, but then it didn't work for me. And I'd say, didn't work. What happened? They said, well, I went back to eating carbs and I gained the weight back. You know, nobody would say that alcohol uh, avoidance doesn't work for them, that going to AA doesn't work for them because they fell off the wagon and went back to drinking. But in this field, they do. The message is carbohydrates are fundamentally fattening. If you eat them, you're going to get fat. We're telling you not to eat them. If you fall off the wagon, if you have a bad day, if you have a bad week, you know that you have to get back to not eating these foods to a more or less rigid abstinence. Evelyn Bordeaux-Roy, who's a physician in Montreal. I love this 
I think caps encapsulated. I can give you pills, she tells her patients, or I can teach you how to eat. As many diabetic patients tell me they can't go low carb because they love pasta and bread too much. I say, imagine if you were allergic to almonds and could eat them, but only with an EpiPen, would you? They say, of course not. So why eat pasta if in order to eat them, you need an insulin shot? And this is a 1960s version of this. Uh, one of my favorite quotes in this business, Blake Donaldson was a New York City cardiologist who started uh, prescribing low carb, high fat diets to his patients around 1920. And in 1962 or so he wrote his memoirs and he said, he tells his patients, you are out of your mind when you take insulin in order to eat Danish pastry. Sue Wolver is a clinician at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University um, who converted to this way of thinking about 10 years ago. And she said, weight loss is a learned skill. Even people who have great effort in the beginning often don't put the time and effort into learning the skill. I ask patients, do you play the guitar? They say, no. And if somebody asks you to play a guitar, could you do it? They say, no, I'd have to practice. And it's just like any other learned skill. You have to practice to be good at it. And it's one of the things that gets me about the medical community in general, when they say people aren't gonna follow the diets, they don't give their patients the motivation to follow it, to say, look, this is something you can get good at eating this way. If you're eating a vegan or vegetarian diet, you have to learn a lot of skills, not just what to order in restaurants and what to avoid, but how to cook to get all the essential minerals and vitamins. You have to do the same thing if you're doing this. I think this would work better if your goal is to reverse obesity, diabetes, overweight, but it takes practice. The longer you do it and the more you practice, the better you get. One of the, a mother with an obese child who has come to feed her child this way, excuse me, a mother with a child with obesity said, you have to learn to choose your words carefully. If you say we do a low carb diet, it's seen as this horrific forbidden thing. If you say we eat vegetables and meats and healthy fats, the response is, oh, that's wonderful. And then something else who over said, it's not easy for everyone. I mean, some people do find it ridiculously easy. She said, it's not all hearts and rainbows. Some people do struggle like crazy. One of the stories I heard over and over again is of couples who went on the diet. So a, a, a woman is prescribed the diet by her physician and her husband decides to go on the uh, eat this way with her. And the husband loses 50 pounds effortlessly and the wife struggles and you know, I wonder how many marriages we've ruined by prescribing this advice. Uh, the opposite clearly can happen as well. And you don't get a cake and ice cream when it's over. This is from Nick Meller, who's a dentist. You know, we, we talk, all these physicians talked about, um, they think of themselves as much as breaking carbohydrate uh, addiction as they do prescribing a weight loss, the way to eat for weight loss or diabetes remission or just for better health. They wanna get people off highly refined grains and sugars. And if they really have a problem with their weight, if they really fatten easily or their they're blood sugar is out of control, they wanna try and get them to the point of almost total abstinence from carbohydrate rich foods. Um, in that sense, it requires breaking an addiction like a 28 day rehab stay but when you go to rehab, you don't get a glass of champagne when you're done to celebrate the fact you went 28 days without alcohol. And in this world, you don't get cake and ice cream when it's over. Uh, it's part of what we have to learn. We are people, if this thinking is correct, we are people who can't eat cake and ice cream without doing our bodies harm. And we have to decide, is it worth it? Ultimately, this is a challenge. This is my last slide. I want to thank you all for Fitting through this, these Zoom lectures are a challenge. But the challenge to all of us is Paul Newman from Cool Hand Loop. What we've got here is a failure to communicate. Our job constantly is to communicate these ideas better, to think about how to communicate them better, to get them across to our colleagues in the, in the medical community, to our friends and neighbors who think that what we're doing is a, some kind of crazy fad. And, you know, I wish you all luck. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I want to thank Sam Feltham and the public uh, PHS for, uh, for hosting this. Okay, take care.
Thank you.